House Ironhearts was dead. And not in a vague, metaphorical sense. They'd been hanged by their necks from the ramparts of their own castle, men, women, and children. Over the castle walls, the anvil of House Ironhearts lowered, and the miner's axe of the rebel general Traft raised. This was all unbeknownst to the town smith, as he drove his wagon through the foothills of the Black Mountains towards what he believed was still his home. The smoke he saw over the horizon did not trouble him. Quite the opposite, for today was, to his knowledge, a feast day. Thus, the smoke made his mouth water, until he came over the last hill and saw his village raised to the ground and swarming with orcs. That's when things suddenly got very dark. The smith hopped down to flee, but a faceless figure in a black hooded cloak blocked his way. The Once and Future Nerd. Book One, Princes of Jordan. Chapter 4, Monsters. Episode 1. We rejoin our party beside the underground lake where we left them. They all looked rather distraught over the admittedly wicked man who had just died on the end of Nelson's sword. Nelson, dude, I can't believe you just killed a guy. Me, me, you killed him. Your sword, bro. Your tackle. You tripped him. Neither of you meant to kill him. Well, he's still fucking dead. That it upsets you is a sign of your humanity. Something to be proud of in this day and age. I think this is yours, Nelson. Regan handed Nelson his waterlogged scabbard. Maybe next time don't throw it down a fucking cave. And you'll want to give your sword a flick. Nelson looked down at his still bloody sword, as though he had never seen it before. Flick your wrist and get some of the blood off your sword, then wipe the rest off. Else that shit'll dry up and get stuck next time you need it. Huh? Give it here. She flicked the drying blood off the sword and wiped it on her sleeve. And girly, I want to talk to you before I go. Talk to me? How long you known me? I don't know, like a, a week? I'm looking you in the eye and I ain't tried to kill you or fuck you, so yeah, safe bet I want to talk to you. Regan pulled a wary Jen behind some rocks so that the two could speak privately. That was the second time in as many days that your boy toy could have gotten you killed. He killed that guy that was going to kill us, sort of, and, and he made those other guys fight the other night. He was stupid and got lucky. Both of those fights could have gone real bad real fast. Billy does things his way and somehow it always seems to work out. No, it doesn't. If it did, you'd be back whatever the fuck, talking about your vagina and not here getting life advice from a thieving, murdering fugitive. It's not his fault we're here. You're smarter than him, but he makes all the decisions. Our relationship is none, none of my business. Trust me, I wish it wasn't, but it damn well is now. I mean, I guess I think a man's supposed to be in charge, you know? And it's kind of nice to get taken care of. When I was a little girl, there were these two cats that always come around a house. It was just me, my mom, and my sister then. Ma could barely feed us, but she always left some scraps for us to give to the cats. She wanted us to learn charity or compassion or some shit. We named them Maggie and Katie. I like Katie better. She'd always eat out of your hand, let you pet her. Maggie never do that shit. She'd take food once in a while. She wouldn't pretend to be a friend for it. I'd rather go hungry, I guess. When Ma died, Katie followed me to the orphanage. She pawed at my window every night for had to be three weeks. The window that was bolted shut. Stupid fucking cat. Then one night she didn't come. I was on garbage duty the next morning. They told me a stray cat died trying to get into the pantry and I had to take it out. I knew it was Katie before I even saw her. Brought her out back where they kept the trash. And I cried over that stupid, fucking, helpless cat. While I was out there, 
I've seen Maggie walk by with a pigeon in her mouth. We locked eyes, and fuck me if the damn thing didn't nod at me. That was the last time I ever cried. Elsewhere in the cave, Brennan, Nia, and Yellowin had their own private conversation regarding the imminent split of the party. The talk had recently turned to Brennan's recurring dreams and Nia's academic opinion thereof. My killer has died as well, but has not yet joined me. The king has loved the enemy. And what was the third? The vessel must crack, but it shall not break. That last one sounds vaguely familiar. As though I read it in a footnote once and forgot it the next day. I'll see if I can do some research in the city. <laughs> I doubt they'll have many books wherever that thief is sending us. Wait for a messenger to come for five dawns. If none comes by the sixth, take the children to the elders and trust no one on the way. And Nia, look after the boys. No harm will come to them, General. I swear on my house. No harm. You mean apart from what they've already endured? I'll give them the best counsel I can. Go with Galadin, General. After the relevant farewells were bid, Brennan found himself scaling a steep egress from the cave on the heels of the so-called Thief Queen and actual princess, Aerona Regan, as much as he hated those facts. And why would these guys mutiny? <clears throat> Hard to say. Redmore's garrison is a vicious, selfish and stupid lot. I'm sure you've said the same about me. Regan emerged from the hole with her ubiquitous bedroll tied to her foot. She saw six horses in Redmoor regalia tied to stakes and grazing. Mm. I never accused you of being stupid. Brennan also pulled himself out of the cave and untied one of the recently killed men's horses. Regan did the same, but of course could not let this transpire without comment. So, you're fine with stealing horses when you need one? These horses were the property of traitors. They're no forfeit to the crown, that's the law. So, armed robbery then. Meanwhile, the rest of the party had returned to where they originally entered the cave. Yiluin had heard the clamor of battle outside, and so ventured out to scout, but had just now returned to report his findings to the humans. The Mooncrest and Redmore armies slaughtered the Felgir host. So that's a good thing for us? I can't tell anymore. The horses are gone, though. I feel the fool for hoping otherwise. It's about a day's walk back to the city. Everyone instinctively looked to Billy, waiting for some obscene complaint to be muttered. Huh? Oh, yeah, that sucks. Some hours later, Brennan and Regan were forced to stop and water their horses by a creek. It was overdue. Those boys need to toughen up, or they're dead. Aye, they do. But it's still more tragedy than they deserve. What fucking tragedy? If they didn't kill that guy, he'd have killed them. Anyone killed is a tragedy. If you're still sore about Bowen... Of course I am. Is it not the god's damn point? Then please, spare me the goody-goody hand-wringing. I expect better from a fucking general. There are monsters in this world, Brennan. I've met plenty. I'm sure you have too. Men so twisted and evil that the world is better off without them. Aye. Is that not a tragedy? Regan responded by spurring her horse into a gallop. It took them a few more hours to reach lands officially held by Gunther Guernatal. That is, you recall Brennan's liege lord and Regan's grandfather. As they neared the first Guernatal outpost of their journey, everything was ostensibly in order. From a distance, Brennan could make out two Guernatal officers' uniforms. But given Brennan's belief that there had been a mutiny, he was cautious. Do they need to know we're coming? No, but I need to know what's happening with Redmore's men. Are they men you can believe? Don't know yet. I can see their faces. Understand something, Brennan. If this little homecoming goes to shit, I'm out. I won't seek vengeance against you if it's not your fault, but you won't see me again. A lifetime of wealth ain't that much if you die tomorrow. Brennan trotted his horse forward to get a better look. I know them. Forgot their names, but I know them by sight. Good men. Horse shit, no such thing. I've put my life in their hands before. And you don't know their names? The benefit of an army bound by honor. By now, Brennan and Regan had reached shouting distance of the officers. Although Brennan could not recall their names, they clearly knew their generals. Hail, General. Welcome home. 
Thank you, Commander. Good to be home. Who's this? New Squire. Uh, they gave you a girl, Squire? Uh, do you got a silver piece and want your cock sucked? <clears throat> Has anything happened with Redmore's garrison? Happened, sir? No. They're vicious, selfish, and stupid as ever. <laughs> Shall we return to the castle? Everyone is awaiting news of your mission. You might recall, as Brennan did, that his mission was meant to be secret. What mission? What the fuck's going on, Brennan? I'm sorry, sir. They have my wife. Redmore Crossbowman leapt from hiding and shot the horses from under Brennan and Regan. They jumped clear, but were surrounded and severely outnumbered. But Regan, ever resourceful when it came to trickery and murder, had managed to produce a small clay pot from some unseen pocket, which she now held over her head. Shoot me! and everyone dies. As much as I'm sure you'd like to hear what became of Regan and Brennan after their capture by Redmore forces, I'm presently going to turn to what the rest of the party was doing during all of this. Because, well, because I want to, damn it. I'll not apologize for my impeccable sense of dramatic pacing. While Brennan and Regan approached the fated outpost, the remainder of our party approached a property on the outskirts of Armstrong Guard, owned by an acquaintance of Regan's. When explaining the nature of this property to Mia, Regan had been asked, So it's a boarding house then? Sure, you can say that. They were greeted by an employee of the establishment, who yelled down from a second floor window. Had this indeed been a boarding house, she probably would have greeted newcomers at the door instead. What's your fancy, friends? She probably would also have been wearing clothes. Oh dear. Allow me. Good evening. We were sent by a friend of Madame Bailey. Is she up for entertaining? <laughs> She's always up for entertaining. Uh, how many years do those three have, though? I beg your pardon? Well, it's 13 to drink and 15 to screw. Oh, I do believe you have misunderstood our intentions. Ah, well, we cater to all. Watch this. I'm choosing not to describe to you the demonstration that ensued for... Although shame is not known among the sprites, the traumatized facial expressions of Billy, Jen, and Nelson following this demonstration reinforced my knowledge that shame is a very powerful human emotion. Once they were safely inside the office of this property's owner, Nia did her best to contextualize what had just been seen. So, you see, the expression of erotic love needn't always be aimed towards procreation. Or constrained by standard human anatomy. The children's discomfort was amplified by the decor of the office, of which the unifying aesthetic was a preoccupation with sexual organs. Good evening to ya. The office's owner entered. Aside from her well-worn evening gown, she bore an uncanny resemblance to the Bailey who had sold our traveller's armour nearly a fortnight ago. I understand you referred to me by a mutual acquaintance. Hey, aren't you the armour lady? No, my sister runs the armoury. I get that a lot, though. Might I ask how you came to be acquainted with Miss, uh... She helped me deal with a few pushy customers. I feel a bit indebted to her. We were told you could furnish us with temporary lodging. Ideally in a, a family-friendly section of the house. Which we would pay for, of course. Oh, I'd be glad to. Just three rules. Any services rendered must be arranged through myself. You break it, you buy it. And Sergeant McShane is always right. Who is Sergeant McShane? City guard. Thing is, my business isn't something of a gray area as far as the law is concerned. Sergeant McShane makes sure the relevant authorities see us in the right light. We shall follow your rules under your roof. If I could be so presumptuous as to ask for one more favor, I was hoping you had someone who could do a small chore for me. Of course. Man or woman? Well, I suppose it doesn't matter, so long as they can read. Read? Well, to each her own. I'll send someone to your room. 
Madam Bailey winked at Nia as she left. Oh, Galadin, help me. What did I just ask for? Later that night, as the party settled into their newfound quarters, Billy and Nelson found themselves stuck alone together. They could only go so long without addressing the killing that transpired the past morning. I know it's good that it happened, but it doesn't feel good that we did it. That's what being a man is though, right? You do the stuff other people aren't strong enough for? I don't know if I want to be that kind of strong. Someone's got to be. Yeah. That blows. Just try not to think about it for a while. I can't shut off my brain like you can. Oh, your genius brain is so high above mine? I didn't mean that. I'd be smart too if my parents taught college. Or if you actually studied? We don't all get affirmative action, Nelson. Are you... Seriously? You want to switch places with me when we get back? Well, not for everything, but you like... You know both my parents are dead, right? Yeah, but... <sighs> There's no but, man. That's my bad. Yeah, well... I think around here we're equally fucked for once. Ha, no bullshit. I kind of thought you'd be more okay with the thing. What thing? You know. He pantomimed a stabbing motion. Why would I be okay with that? I don't know. Because everyone shits on you and you play a lot of video games? I half expected you to shoot up to school one of these days. Well, turns out I haven't been desensitized to violence after all. Plus, I'm black, you know? It's only video games' fault when a white guy shoots up the high school. If I did it, they'd find some article my dad wrote defending Islam or something. That what your dad taught? Cultural anthropology. I don't even know what the fuck that means. He studied other societies and cultures so he could show how fucked up ours is. What would he say about this fucking place? I don't even know. You know what's fucking with me, man? I know we had to do that. But like, even if we get back home, I'll never have not killed someone. Like, the part of me that's never killed anyone is gonna stay in that cave, and it's never gonna come home with me. Now, I've mentioned before that Jen had grown quite attached to a device which she called an iPhone, and which I admittedly do not understand. As she stood in the hallway outside the bedrooms, she stared with great melancholy at a message informing her that whatever sorcery powered the device had at last expired. She threw the device in her handbag, took a breath, and knocked on the door to the room containing Billy and Nelson. Hey. Hey. She sat down next to Billy and kissed him on the cheek. How you guys holding up? Fine. You sure? You seemed pretty upset before. I'm fine. You can talk to me, you know? It's all right. How is it all right? Jen stared at Billy for a moment before standing and storming out of the room. Shit. Nia, meanwhile, had just finished compiling a list of research materials when there was a knock on her door. Come in. Jen entered somewhat sheepishly. Am I interrupting anything? No. Come and sit. How are the boys faring? Not well, I don't think. Poor things. I'll talk to them as soon as I send out for these books. Not sure how far you'll get. When Billy's upset, he doesn't really talk about anything. I think he is afraid to seem weak. Yeah, I just think that maybe if I ask him the right way... You mustn't blame yourself. You're a very caring soul, Jen. I hate that you must be in this place. My phone just died. Your what? Oh, it's like, um, a diary that a lot of people from home wrote in, and I can't read it anymore. That was like, it, you know? Last thing I had that was still like home. Why can't you access it? Hmm, how do I explain this? So, so lightning. People where I'm from actually study it a lot. Some do here as well. Would a lightning enchantment let you access the diary? It might, actually. I didn't even think of that. I'm sad to say I don't know any, but I'm sending out for books. I can look for a spell that might help. I know it must seem crazy, but that would help me a lot. I don't want to get your hopes up. Lightning spells are especially tricky and can have some blasphemous associations. Yes? Both women were surprised to see a very handsome man enter the room wearing very little clothing. Hello. Oh my. I'm 
afraid your attire may not be appropriate for what He removed I... what remained of his clothing without hesitation. Gallant oh, grace. No, 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 no. More clothes, not fewer. He looked at her, utterly confused. We are not going to have relations. Do you understand? Now he nodded in understanding, having had many patrons who had not wanted carnal relations with him. These patrons had, however, typically expected him to have carnal relations with his hand, which he presently set to with wild enthusiasm. Okay, so that's happening. I and need just... you to get some books. Can you... Wow. My God, are you dizzy? You can't possibly have enough blood to... Can you read? He nodded yes without missing a beat. I'm going to give you a list. Can you please stop that and put your clothes on? Uh, he doesn't need to get dressed for you to give him the list. Please get dressed. Looking more confused than ever, the man ceased his performance and tried to replace what little clothing he had entered with. In his present state, it didn't quite fit. Maybe you should make him some ice. Have Madame Bailey give you some street clothes, then take this list to the library at the college. Pray bring back the books on it as soon as you can. Nia handed the man the list, looked him up and down once more, and with some regret... Thank you. ...shooed him towards the door. So, I haven't had a bath since I left the city, so I should probably... Right, yeah, yeah, me neither. ...a cared-for body is a well-ordered body, so totally. if you'll just excuse me. This uncomfortable exchange was interrupted when a young girl ran into the room and dove under the bed. Nia and Jen exchanged befuddled looks before Jen dropped to her knees to address the diminutive intruder. Hi, honey. Are you lost? Wh where's your mommy and daddy? The girl was silently crying. The door opened again, and the handsome man who had recently left entered again, closing the door behind him and blocking it with his body. He looked terrified. What in your heaven? Jen looked to Nia, troubled. From the hallway, they could make out two pairs of footsteps, one of heavy boots and the other of a fashionable woman. You know how fickle children can be. Nia? The man pointed towards the girl under the bed and desperately shook his head no. Am I interrupting anything? Jen realized what needed to be done, steeled her nerves, took a deep breath. Oh, 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 Sorry. Oh our young Jen has grown quite fond of the errand boy you sent, lied Nia as she poked her head out to address Madame Bailey and the well-groomed city guardsman she was with. How much do I owe you? On the house. You haven't by chance seen a little girl running around tonight, have you? Afraid I haven't. The poor dear has gone missing at bedtime. If you see or hear anything, please let me know. I surely will. Thank you. Oh, and where are my manners? Nia, this is Sergeant McShane. Nia struggled to feign a smile. Pleasure. As Nia closed the door to the room behind her, she saw Jen sitting on the bed with the man, comforting the girl. This was the first time she had a chance to notice the striking resemblance between the girl and the man. It was also the first time she had ever seen such fury in Jen's eyes. Now, to understand much of what follows in our tale, you will need to know a bit about what had been happening in the West with the rebel General Traft. I wish there were a better time to explain this, but soon things are going to get very interesting indeed for our party of travellers. So, best to tell you about Traft now. You'll recall the unfortunate blacksmith who was taken prisoner on his way back to the now ruined castle Ironhurts. What? Well, you didn't think I'd introduce you to a man just as tragedy befell him, only to never speak of him again, did you? What sort of lunatic would do such a thing? In any event, we rejoined the blacksmith as his cloaked captors led him through the ruins of his hometown. He wept for the devastation he saw, and for the many mutilated bodies of the men charged with defending the town. Then they came to the town square. 
The smith had, of course, heard stories of orcs before, but had counted himself fortunate that he had never seen an orc. Until now. Now he saw pointed teeth and ashen skin and gruesome war paint. In short, he saw everything the stories warned of. Which is, of course, the great power of stories. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Though the rest of the surviving townsmen were encircled by several dozen orcs, the smith was led past them towards a recently erected tent. This was General Traft's command tent. In it, Traft had counsel with chieftains of the various orc tribes which comprised his army. The civic guard will be here by night. If we hold until morning, our reinforcements will defeat them and we can attack Blackhold. How many brothers survived this last attack? Said Traft, in a tongue that I am doing my best to translate. Its name meant army, and it had been created so that the clans could converse in their camps. It was... well, they were still working on it. Many brothers fell before the Templars could open the gate. I dislike the Templars, Brother General. What did he say about my mother? Templars? He dislikes the Templars. Rutma means cares for things. Rutma means cares for people. Respect, brother, but I don't know why my mother is involved. Oh, God, ready and help us. We need to fix this language. Continue your report, brother. Near to 400 brothers remain. I'm less concerned with numbers than with arms. They have Easterner steel. That is being worked on. As if on cue, the cloaked things, Templars, Traft called them, just then entered the tent with the smith in tow. Traft switched the common tongue of the human realms of Jordan. Just as I said, leave us please. The smith looked at this half-orc general he had heard so much about. His body was sinewy, his tanned head was shaved, and his face was decorated with orcish war paint. Six Hills clan, specifically. But of course, the smith didn't know that. Have a seat. The smith looked around and saw no chairs. Traft casually tossed aside his weapons, a double-headed scythe and a miner's axe, and sat on the ground. Cautiously, the smith followed his lead. I don't think it's rude if I assume you know who I am. Sorry to say I don't know who you are. What's your name? It's Smith. <laughs> No shit. My father was called Smith, so was his father. That ever bother you? I'm not ashamed of what I do. Well, you shouldn't be. I mean, does it ever bother you that they name you after what you do for them? I... I, I, I don't think I understand. Now, let me get right to it, Smith the Smith. I know there's a pretty sizable arsenal near here. I know it was promised to the Civic Guard, but I'm pretty sure they ain't claimed it yet. I know you know where it is because you put it there. Very keen to acquire that arsenal, Smith the Smith, and I'd kindly appreciate it if you told me where to find it. What happens if I don't? Well, I'll be forced to retreat. The Civic Guard will take this castle, and I'll keep on with this war for a while longer. Probably lose eventually. They'll flay me to death, and that'll be the story of me. You're not going to torture me. Well, I reckon you'll live out the rest of your days the same as you've been doing. How much are they paying you for that arsenal, Smith? Give me a number, maybe I can do better. I'm not gonna betray the realm for some extra gold. You know what alchemy is, Smith the Smith? That's when you make gold out of something else. Right. Out of something more common, or else what's the sense? It's quite the power. No one's ever done it. But they have. The princes of Jordan and their elf overlords have mastered alchemy. They figured out how to turn your sweat into their gold. They use the steel there you break your back to make so they can defend their lands. When they defend their lands, they defend everyone. And how defended do you feel right now? They collect taxes on the lands they hold, don't they? And profit off the fruits of those lands. Do you see any of that profit? I can get enough to feed my family. You ain't got a family. 
You'd already asked about them. When I did, I mean. What happened to them? They returned to Gallatin. If I remember, there was a pretty bad fever swept through the foothills about five or six years ago. It was an orc raid down by the river when they went to get water. I'm sorry to hear that, Smith. You're sorry? Then put a stop to it. Take your monsters back across the mountains where they belonged. Why do you think those raids happened, Smith? How should I know, savages? Do you know how I was conceived, Smith? I wasn't there. But you must have heard tell. Orc raid. Please continue. Tell me what they've said. They say that an, an orc... Well... An orc raped my mother and that's where I came from, right? That's what they say. They were probably around 50 orcs in that raiding party. Dozen or so got it in their heads to start raping. My father wanted to stop them. He hid my mother, a human woman he didn't know at all, and fought off a dozen of his peers before the chieftain came through and broke up the fight. That's the story she told me on her deathbed. So maybe some orcs have some decency in them. What's your point? My point, Smith the Smith, is to be wary of stories you hear, especially ones that help the powerful stay in power. Those princes I strung up, I asked each of them, who do you serve? First few thought it'd be brave to say gala down the realm and the king. After I hanged a couple, they started saying they'd serve me or they'd serve whoever I wanted them to. Now that made me real sore. They jumped from serving the people who had power over them most of their lives to serving the man who had power over them right then, namely me. No one thought for half a God's damn second that maybe they should serve someone with less power than them. You see, Smith, everyone in this world has to choose who they're going to serve. Unfortunately, you're going to have to choose a little sooner than you might like. Now Traft straightened up and looked Smith straight in the eyes. They weren't going to pay you for the arsenal, were they? They was going to claim a crisis of the realm and take it all for free. Smith blinked first. <laughs> That's what I thought. What if you still had a family? You'd be counting on payment for those weapons to feed them. What about your friends who mine the iron and coal for your steel? Don't they have families? Shouldn't they see some of the wealth that the princes of Jordan gain with the iron they mine? With the steel you make? Hard work is its own reward. Did Hans Ironhurt's wife ever have to go outside the walls to get water? It's a lady's right to be safe in her family's castle. Who gave her that right? Who denied that right to your wife? Galadin. Smith traced the circle around his heart. Dubious theology aside, how do they hold on to that right? It's just the way things are. What if before I came through here, y'all just marched up to the inner hold and demanded to stay? I imagine they'd tell us to leave. And if you didn't? If you stayed and started pounding on the gates, can you imagine any way that wouldn't end with y'all getting cut down? I suppose I can't. They'd have cut your wife down with steel you made. The blood of commoners is the not-so-secret ingredient in their alchemy. Before me, every war you saw was between one prince and another. That is what they do with the steel and gold born of common sweat. Not bread for your belly, not a home for your family, not shoes for your children. Instead of feeding you, they feed the monster they created. War so that they can become more powerful. But you started a war. My war, Smith is for the people who've never had power. I can't promise that no evil will come of it. I can't even promise that the results will be good, all told. But I can promise this will be the first war you'll see not fought for the strong to get stronger. So here's my question for you, Smith. Smith the man, Smith the townsman, Smith the sculptor of steel, Smith the widower whose wife contracted a fatal case of not being born to the right family. Who do you serve? The princes? Who've proven in no uncertain terms that they do not serve you? Or will you serve those who actually need your help? How do I know who you actually want to help? You're a chaos worshiper. Well, Smith, it's my word against theirs. 
So what you need to ask yourself is if you believe what they've told you in the past. That answer you gave as to why your wife had to die, that it's their right, that it's the way things are, that Galadon willed it. You need to ask yourself whether you're really satisfied with that answer. The small detachment of Civic Guard had traveled non-stop since dawn. They were relieved finally to reach the hill marked on the map that Smith had given to them when he pledged the weapons. They fumbled around for a while to find the well-concealed tarp, and then excitedly pulled it back to reveal an empty hole. Then the ambush came. The realization that haunted these guardsmen in their dying moments was not that orcs had found them, but rather that the orcs who beset them were armed not with stone weapons, but with well-made steel. We'll now rejoin Brennan and Regan. You'll recall that the pair had been ambushed, but Regan had managed to stalemate an otherwise hopeless confrontation by brandishing a small clay pot. You fuckers know what this shit is? Ever heard of thunder dust? Yeah, you have. You shoot me, I drop this, and we get blown to Selbrin. Don't be a fool, girl. They can just walk out of range, said a Guernatal officer, regarding the several Redmore crossbow men with sights on Brennan and Regan. Yeah, but the general still gets turned to shepherd's pie. They want him dead. Their orders are kill on sight. Sure, but I'll bet whoever put them up to it is going to want to see some proof. So they need a recognizable corpse. So you're just going to head back that way, and we're going to head back this way. No, we're not. What? what? We're going to the castle. Have you lost your fucking mind? Take us to his majesty. Tell us who started this mutiny, and I'll petition for your lives to be spared. Hang on. I've got the thunder dust, so we're going where I say. I'm the body they're keeping you alive for. We go where I say, and I say the castle. It's all right, Melody. Worst of it's over. Arlene's yelp was in response to an ear piercing that Gwen had just performed for her. Gwen pulled the needle through, and with it some fine silver thread. She fastened a knot around her lady's ear to shape it into a point, like an elf's. I still don't know why you poor highborn girls have to go through all that for a wedding. I think your ears are perfectly fair the way they are. <laughs> I didn't mean... They look beautiful. I failed us, Gwen. I could have stopped him. Had I any courage at all. It wasn't the right moment. Then when is? He's more powerful than ever now. Ardell's not as clever as he thinks he is. We'll get another chance. And I'll fail again like I've failed all my life. You haven't failed all your life. Haven't I? Then show me one God's damn thing I have to show for my successes. Gwen looked down, hurt. Oh, oh I didn't mean to shout at you, Gwen. You needn't apologize. You may speak to your servants however you wish. You must realize by now that you're more than a servant to me. Please don't stay cross with me. You've worried yourself sick these last few days, milady. Why don't we take a walk in the garden? Arlene lay down on her side. Will you lay with me, Gwen? Just for a little while? After a moment of surprise at this novel request, Gwen obliged. My embrace truly mean that much to you? Back when you were homesick? Of course, milady. I knew I'd found a home. What's that feel like? Gwen moved herself close to Arlene and put an arm around her. Both closed their eyes, drinking in a feeling that almost resembled safety. Tell me I'm good. You're good. Tell me I'm worth something. You're worth the world. Tell me I'll be happy one day. 
Almost without realizing she was doing it, Gwen placed a gentle kiss on Arlene's neck. Their eyes jolted open, and Arlene whirled round to look at Gwen. The two looked at each other with the same look you might see when a doe spots a hunter. Before either could say or do anything further, What's going on? Emergency court meeting. The emergency meeting had been called as a result of some important news Ardell Redmore had gotten from one of his advisers. Captured? My orders were to kill on sight. I will need to arrange a whole show of a trial. Give the men who captured him their hundred gold pieces, then have them killed for disobeying my orders. Arlene and Gwen entered the main hall through an upper level gallery and looked down at Ardell sitting smugly in the throne he had recently usurped from Gunther Guernathal. There was a palpable shock in the court when the main doors flew open and Brennan strode in, shackled. Your Majesty, I've been... That was when he saw Ardell Redmore sitting where Gunther Guernathal should have been. You impudent ingrate! How dare you presume to sit in that throne? Where's his majesty? Regan, also shackled, was led into the hall behind Brennan. He awaits trial for treasons against the realm, blasphemies against Galadon, and issuing orders which would bring dishonor. You're a liar. None of this will stand. General Brennan of Greyfield, you are charged with conspiracy to commit treason against the realm, conspiracy to blaspheme against Galadon, carrying out dishonorable orders, and so... Oh, why not? Consorting with prostitutes in a manner unbecoming of an officer. How do you plead? I'll die before I'm judged by the likes of you. You are now charged with obstructing an investigation of this court. Do you deny leaving this castle under clandestine orders from Gunther Guernatal? There is a special rack in Selberin for traitors, you upjumped shite. You are now charged with addressing nobility in an obscene manner. You will face trial in the morning. Take him away. Two of Ardell's men tried to follow this order, but they could not get Brennan's considerable heft to budge. Get your hands off me, you fucking swain. That's two counts of obscenity. It finally took six men to drag the raging general away. You. Meaning, Regan? You are charged with vagrancy, ludity, and seducing an officer of the military. How do you plead? Bite my cunt! Oh my In the morning, you will be hung from your neck until dead. And give my asshole a couple licks while you're down there. What did she say? That's just common curse. His Majesty High King Gunther Guernathal was sitting on the stone floor of a dungeon cell, in no way fit for royalty, when he heard the heavy footsteps. Soon he was face to face with the captured general in whom all his hopes for salvation had once rested. They sat in silence for several minutes before Gunther decided what he wanted to say. It's not your fault. If I had gotten her back a bit sooner. You couldn't have predicted Redmore's betrayal. I'm supposed to be the one with a mind for politics. Vicious men triumph because they do things virtuous men would never think of. It would have been nice to meet her. She's... she's of a different world than you or I. No doubt. What's her name, by the way? Erona Regan. Erona? That's a name from the old times. Her grandmother loved all the stories from the old times. But it's blasphemy to praise the false idols of the past. Indeed. But the thing about women is the blasphemous ones are often... Well, never mind all that. You never got to read much history, did you? Never from the time. Mm. How could you? I've always had you out killing someone or another for me. It was my greatest honor to serve. I know, friend. I know. I should have knighted you. I'm sorry about that. I was always waiting for the right time to deal with all the backlash. So, who was this Irona from the old times? Well, they pronounced it Irona then. Back before the elves brought peace and men were just warring tribes. She was a famous warrior queen. Sounds about right. Oh? She's violent, devious, ruthless, uncompromising. Doesn't give a damn about anyone but herself. So, you're saying... If only she gave a damn about anyone but herself, she'd be a perfect queen. 
Elsewhere in the dungeon, a somewhat dense Redmoor soldier left Regan standing in a corner with her hands shackled behind her back while he tried fruitlessly to open and examine her bedroll. He was thus distracted when Regan squatted and scooted her manacled hands behind her to the back of her knees. In the same motion, she sat and rocked backward and passed the chain under her feet and then stood instantly and effortlessly. If it looked like a thing she'd practiced many times, it was. She crept up behind the soldier. We shall take a turn from that grisly scene back to Madame Bailey's. You'll recall that, in order to protect a young girl, Jen had recently proved herself a passable thespian. Her performance was at least convincing enough to make Billy come running, and barely to notice the young girl in the room when he saw the scantily clad man. What the fuck's happening, Jen? Sometimes, at the peak of erotic excitement... Weenie, shut the fuck up! I leave you alone for ten minutes and you're nailing this guy? No, that's not... Christ, Billy, not everything is about you. What's that kid doing here? Close the door. Jen's performance was a ruse to keep Sergeant McShane away. Which one is Sergeant McShane again? If I recall, he is city guard and friend to our host. He's a monster. He knows sons and daughters of whores have nowhere else to go. That's why he comes here. Wait, comes here for what? He's a child molester, Billy. Whoa, shit. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure. No offense, but are we expected to merely take your word? I saw the way she looked when she came in here. Whatever he wanted with her, it, it wasn't anything good. So what do we do? We kick his fucking ass is what we do. Why not just report him to his superiors? Surely they would disapprove. Then we'll all be in jail, and the kids will be in orphanages. There's no better for them in there. We should leave this place. We can escort you two as far as... You think as... I'm here because I've got better options. Yellowin, take the children elsewhere. I'll stay here to hide these two until McShane leaves. What about all the other kids? I can only hide so many in this room before someone notices. No, we, we need to stop him or it's just going to keep happening. This world is filled with evil. The righteous must choose their battles. We cannot win this one. I refuse to believe that. Well, we certainly can't do anything tonight. Let's try to get some sleep and think on it in the morning. Jen stroked the young girl's hair. You're gonna be all right. I promise. Back at Castle Guernatal, Gwen searched the cavernous pantry for some sweet to cheer up her mistress. As she moved aside a small barrel, Ingrid, get! A mangy cat skulked away deeper into the shelves. Sensing the commotion outside was nothing good, Gwen looked frantically for a place to hide in the pantry. She found a barely remembered service door that led through some tunnels and out of the castle. She had no intention of leaving, but she breathed a sigh of relief at having a way out if the need should... Oof. Gwen wheeled around to see a Mooncrest-style sword pointed at her. Holding it was the very determined-looking woman she had seen in court a few hours before. Move or you die. You're the one they brought in with the general. And I'll be leaving by myself, right through that door. Maybe over your corpse, but that's up to you. You escaped. I can see you're a little slow, so I'm gonna give you one more try. How many men did you kill to escape? As many as I had to. If you move right the fuck now, you won't be one of them. If not, I will put this sword through you and you will die. Got it? You can save the king and the general. But I won't. Last chance. Help us. I beg of you. Fuck. I tried. Gwen closed her eyes as Regan raised her sword. The mangy cat leapt at Regan. Reflexively, Regan flicked her sword towards her feline assailant. Two bloody halves of Ingrid the cat fell to the ground. Shit. Strangely, and for the first time in many years, it took concentration for Regan not to look shaken. Was that your cat? Wasn't really anyone's. 
But I fed her. Sorry about that. So, do I have to kill you too? No, you can help instead. You're not gonna be a hero. You're just gonna be dead. Servants don't make it into the songs. Ardell Redmore is a monster. Good people will suffer if he's not stopped. Good people suffer no matter what. I don't need to suffer too. Sorry, sweetheart. Do yourself a favor and close your eyes. No. Have it your way. Regan raised the sword once more. Look me in the eyes. Understand the pain and despair that's brought me to this. Does that make you feel nothing? Nope. I'm sorry. I imagine in your shoes I'd say the same, but... I'm sorry. Oh, God, fucking damn it! What are you so eager to die for? Love. Love. Love? Are you fucking... Love? You scrape up everyone's shit so they'll feed you. How could you possibly be so fucking stupid as to love anything? Only other choice is to hate everything. That's not living. You get that off some horseshit preacher? Me sister, before she died. Regan's eyes were lit coals. She went this way. Close your eyes, okay? Gwen took a breath, closed her eyes, and bowed her head. As Regan cleaned the blade of her sword, she found herself wondering, for the first time she could remember, if she hadn't just made an awful mistake. And as she wondered, Gunther and Brennan spoke to each other from their respective cells. So, this is what weakness feels like. Weak is not a thing you've ever been, Brennan. I remember you cutting three men clean in half with one blow. I cannot get you out of here now. That's weakness. They'll come for you first. I know you want to fight back. Please don't. I'm going to make him beat me to death in front of everyone. The court should face the brutality of the men they chose to lead. The pretentious sycophants in my court only tolerated you because of me. You know that. They won't care to see you suffer. Only I will. That's what Redmore wants. Don't give him the satisfaction. That's my last order. Just tell me I served you well, and I'll die content. Regan could not help but feel a bit sorry for the serving girl she had just met. For though Gwen was very much alive, like as not she would have to clean up the trail of Redmore corpses Regan had made on her way back through the kitchen and back down to the dungeon. Hey, General. As she committed herself to a decision she sorely hoped she would not regret, Brennan's eyes snapped up at the sound of the last voice he ever expected to hear. I think we're due to leave. Nia dreamt of her childhood, of riding ponies on her father's lands with her sisters. It was a fond memory, which made the black silhouette dancing frantically on the horizon all the more worrying in comparison. Nia jumped as a small hand brushed her leg. She looked down at a small girl she had never seen before. The girl seemed unperturbed by the gaping puncture wound in her chest. There are seven things you must know to save me. The fourth thing is, I shall ride to safety on the wings of the storm. Nia's eyes popped open in the armchair in her room at Madame Bailey's. She was moist with cold sweat. Elsewhere in the house, Jen bathed in a brass tub. She found her anger had improved her concentration. If you had looked closely, you would have seen the fine hairs on her arms stand on end, though the skin around them was not raised as it would have been were she cold. Hey, babe. Jen opened her eyes to see Billy standing in the doorway. I'm sorry. I'm kind of messed up right now. Yeah, me too. Billy sat near the tub. You want to talk about it? Not really, but not because of you or anything. I. I just don't know what to say. That's okay. You seem pretty pissed before. We don't have to talk about everything. I just... 
Well, neither of us was ready for this place. We need each other. It's okay for me to have your back sometimes. I know, but it's like a crisis is when a man has to be a man the most. Your dad tell you that? TV. To be honest, I was getting pretty tired of the men on TV. She leaned in gently to kiss Billy. Ow! What? Got shocked. That was weird. Come here. She kissed him passionately as she removed his shirt. In the dungeon of Castle Guernatal, Regan opened the cell that held Brennan. On your feet, Grandpa. Don't make me regret this. She dropped his weapons on the floor in front of him. Get his majesty. Regan opened the adjacent cell. She and his majesty, High King Gunther Guernatal, saw each other for the first time. Is this her, Brennan? Aye. Let me look on you. So this is my grandpa? Grandpa? You should kneel before his majesty. We should get the fuck out of here. Please tell me you know a better way than straight up the stairs. Brennan led them through the same tunnel he used when last he left Castle Guernatal. Why'd you say my name like that? Irana? Yeah. That's what my ma used to say when she was mad at me. That's how it was said in the old times. Your grandmother used to love stories of the old times. You mean before you fucked her and left her to starve? See what I mean? You could do to learn some manners, girl. God, I should have just left you behind. I see you went back for your bedroll. I sleep better with it. You never struck me as one concerned with creature comforts. I sleep better with it. Here we are. The light from the torch Brennan carried revealed a lever on the wall with a faint outline of a doorway. It breaks my heart to retreat from my own house, Brennan. We'll be back before long, and I'll bring you the head of that usurping little shite. Brennan pulled the lever and the wall slid open. A Redmore soldier was waiting in the pouring rain with a crossbow. Brennan and Regan reflexively dodged his bolt as Regan sent a razor star whistling through the soldier's throat. They looked back and saw the bolt buried in Gunther's chest. He coughed blood and fell to his knees as Brennan ran to catch him. Don't worry, we'll get you to a doctor. I'm sure we can find one in Amstrongard. You just need to stay awake for a little while. But the king's eyes were empty. Brennan. Be quiet and help me move him. Brennan, you know damn Shut well. up! He's dead, and we will be too if we don't leave right now. Three Redmore pikemen came to block the apparently not-so-secret exit. Halt! In the name of the Lord Regent! Brennan looked them in the eyes for half a moment, and then unleashed a terrible and inhuman sound. The faces of the soldiers turned to pale terror. They dropped their pikes and turned to flee, but Brennan was on them. He swung his axe once and cut the three men clean in half. Through the rain, Brennan could make out two men trying clumsily to run away through the mud. This time, he recognized the two Guernatal officers who had aided in his capture immediately. He hit each in the leg with a throwing axe and trotted up to the now lame men. General, mercy, please! He ripped off both their helms, quickly and deliberately. The hem of what? Look what Brennan grabbed what each man around the mouth and lifted them off the ground, one in each hand. He brought their heads together with terrible force. No. Please. Again, and again, and again. When he held only two fistfuls of bloody pulp, only then did he let the bodies fall into the mud. The excitement of battle and exhaustion in his arms meant that he noticed the arrows strike his arm as a detached observer. He saw the archer on the ramparts frantically trying to reload and planted a throwing axe squarely in his chest. Before more could replace him, Brennan made haste back to the secret exit. He arrived in time to see Regan deliver a killing stroke to the last of four Redmore soldiers. There'll be more coming. Regan produced a large clay pot. Not through this door. Brennan saw that the creek into which the sewage pipe entered was running white and furious in the downpour. He hoisted Gunther's body over his shoulders. Into the creek. And dove in. 
Regan lobbed the pot down the corridor and dove in as well as her pot exploded and collapsed the tunnel. Redmore Cavalry tried to give chase, but the mud was disastrous for their horses. Arrows fell ineffectually into the water, and archers watched with despair as three shapes disappeared in the torrent. The sun was just rising on Madame Bailey's when there was a knock on Nia's door. Who is it? The young girl Nia was hiding darted under the bed. It's Jen. Nia cautiously cracked the door to check and then let Jen in. I saw him outside getting ready to leave. McShane? Yeah. Good. When he does, we can depart this wicked place. No, that, that won't fix anything. It's going to keep happening. We'll have saved one child, at least for a while. Please, Jen, let it go. This is the kind of wickedness so vile and rotten that it pollutes even those who combat it. Jen looked over to the prostitute and his young sister, desperate for something to say. I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? I don't know. Everything. <laughs> I do like some things about my life. I know what I... I just wouldn't have liked it if someone looked at me the way that I was looking at you. You're not me. No. I could have walked away. You should go and gather your things. Tell the boys as well. Regan awoke on the banks of a small lake to the sound of Brennan groaning and popped up with her sword ready. What's happening? I'm fucking old is what's happening. Brennan ripped the arrow out of his arm and held his hand over the bleeding wound. You just fought harder than most young men I've seen. Aye, and I did it with the body of one fucking old one. That's when he saw the lifeless body of the former High King, His Late Majesty Gunther Guernatal. As he painfully remembered all that had brought him to the banks of this lake, his face betrayed a furious kind of despair that very few people could understand. I'm sorry about the King, Brennan. There was nothing... Brennan to leapt to his feet and unslung his axe. Regan instinctively went for her sword but Brennan dropped his axe at her feet. The king is dead. He knelt. Long live the queen. S sorry. What? I await your grace's orders. Okay, first stand up because that's fucking weird. He did. All right, now sit down and let's deal with the hole in your arm. Regan unraveled her bedroll to reveal a small armory of very nasty looking things. And of course, her long sword, half sword, and dagger. Told you I sleep better with it. From among the weapons, the likes of many of which Brennan had never seen, despite his decades on the fields of battle, she produced some bandages. So, uh, by royal decree, I... What the fuck do we do now? First we find the children. Then we may need to appeal to the elves directly. Tell them the high throne has been usurped. If only we could have gotten Gunther's Talisman of Dominion. What's that? Talismans of Dominion are elven artifacts, very beautiful, given to each of the great houses to signify that the Elvish High Council will recognize their rule. And there was one of those back at the castle? Aye, kept in a heavily guarded vault far below ground. Was it, by any chance, like a platinum egg with all kinds of jewels and shit on it? Aye, how did you... You stole it, didn't you? Regan unwrapped the cloth bundle she had carried since the castle to reveal the exact artifact Brennan had just described. I'm not going to escape from a castle and not start by the vault. <laughs> you know something, Your Grace. If I ever had a daughter, I'd pray to every god there is she'd turn out nothing like you. <laughs> All the same, I think we can get along. I think I know what you mean. The night we met at the tavern. That was clever. With the brandy. Please. A cheap, desperate trick. Beating two men to death with each other? That was inspired. Oh. <laughs> now Brennan grew very somber. Does it trouble you? How easy it is to kill? At least I'm alive to be troubled. Before we spoke of monsters. Men so twisted that the world is better off without them. I'm one of them. If you're a monster... I don't want to know what I am. But I'm starting to think the world needs us. 
What good can a man possibly do, when all he knows is how to destroy? He can destroy bad men. The men who make it so that I had to be this way, or die. In the songs, it's always virtuous men who vanquish evil. Truth of it is, though, you cannot fight evil and live without becoming a bit evil yourself. That's why you and I are so well suited for it. In her own room at Madame Bailey's, Jen looked at her ashen visage in the looking glass. She splashed water into her mouth in a futile attempt to wash out the sick taste. She tried to steady her breathing, but found that she could not stop shaking. She searched her mind for a peaceful memory. Cheerleading. The applause of a crowd directed at her. Her teammates congratulating her in the locker room. The locker room. Her hand mindlessly found the dirk she had left on her dresser, and she felt a strange sense of calm. As she walked across the foyer and through the batwing doors into the accusing light of the early morning, she felt as though her steadily pumping legs belonged to someone else she did not know. Sergeant McShane took a step down from his coach to look her up and down. Eh, sorry, dearie. Maybe a few years ago. Jen plunged the dirk into McShane's belly. Ah! His shock was almost as profound as hers. Coming to her senses after a short eternity, Jen yanked the sword up into McShane's ribs and then out. He fell forwards into a pile of his own innards. Jen looked down at his corpse, shaking and weeping. <laughs> she closed her eyes. For additional information and bonus content, access onceandfuturenerd.com on your computer machine. New episodes are released every other Sunday. The Once and Future Nerd is written and created by Zach Glass and Christian Madeira, and directed and edited by Christian Madeira. It is performed by Rhiannon Angel, Garrett Armin, Dan Dobransky, Lily Drexler, Hayes Dunlop, Anya Gibeon, Ian Harkins, Paul Notice, Frank Querez, and Julie Reed. It is co-executive produced by Jess Kelly. The Once in Future Nerd is recorded by Brian Forbes at the Gallery Recording Studio in Brooklyn, New York, with second unit production sound by Gary O'Keefe. Foley, sound design, and post-production mixing is done by Sandra Ramirez. Theme music is composed by Tom Lee. Alex Story is an associate producer. Thanks for downloading 